Okay, uh, good morning and uh, welcome to this uh, seventh session uh, um, of the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee. Um, this morning we'll be taking evidence from uh, Brian Wilson, uh, the, off, uh, the author of the uh, Scottish, um, I'll get the right name, It's the Wilson Review for Scottish, Scottish Exports. Mr Wilson, this morning um, we've had evidence already from qu quite a number of people with regard to your review, and your review's come up uh, with uh, a lot of people. Um, but before we go to the questions, uh, uh, Dougie's just reminded me that we should obviously ask everyone to switch off their mobile phones. If you have any other electronic devices, I can actually put them to silent this morning because it does interfere with broadcasting. Uh, turning back to yourself, Mr Wilson, good morning and welcome. And we've had uh, evidence sessions already uh, with regard to the internationalisation of the exports for Scotland. In your review, you're very complimentary when you were actually going around uh, gathering evidence. Um, but you were also stating uh, one element within your review, that there should be a seamless and coordinated approach um, to the exports and there's a lot of frustrations around and some of that frustration I think was the fact that it was uh, I think in your words a plethora of different organisations. Since the, uh, the review came out Mr Wilson what advance has been made in your opinion if any? Well thanks very much for asking me along and uh, uh, I'm, as far as advances since the the review came out is that I, um, I understand that there is now a working group between SDI and UKTI, uh, and I think also involving the Scotland office, which is taking forward the recommendations of the review. And that, to me, that's a very welcome that there is a there is a follow through from it that it hasn't just disappeared into a an, a, an abyss. A, and and I'm sure that the work of this committee will will also um, help to inform that. The the thing about the you know, the, the seamless approach which it came across all the time and which I'm sure every review of Scottish exporting for the past umpteen years has heard. Uh, what I was trying there to avoid just the usual cliches about one-stop shops and just to, to go beyond acknowledging the problem in order to try to come up with some sort of solution. And the, the best I could come up with w was, was this single organisation. And again, I was very wary of not trying to create a problem of too many organisations by recommending the establishment of another organisation. So the, the approach that I came down in favour of was almost a virtual organisation called Export Scotland, but which would just create a framework in which everybody, what, what matters to, to the people who are coming through the door, it doesn't matter what organisation they're dealing with. All we want to do is that they come through the door, but there's a logical progression that they get their, the support they need or the concerns they have answered, and they come out the door with a conclusion. And that conclusion might be that they shouldn't be exporting at all, or they certainly shouldn't be trying to export to China before they export to Ireland, or something. You know, There's a, a whole range of possible conclusions. But the important thing is that there is a process through that and therefore the, the onus seemed to me to be on the plethora of organisations led by government, guided by government, to create that seamless approach. And what, what the problem at the moment just now is not just there's a plethora of organisations, but there's a lack of coordination among them so that there is, no, uh, there is no sense for the person or the business entering the system that they are into that single channel which will lead them to a, a, a definitive conclusion. So why do you think there is this uh, sort of continuum of lack of coordination is it because organizations just want to have this autonomous aspect of exports without engaging in this um, you said you know you don't want to use the term uh, uh, one-stop shop however you are, you are promoting a single sort of portal uh, in terms of gathering that information together uh, well, I'm sure there's a lot of historic reasons. I'm sure there's all the usual factors we, we're familiar with. There are always silos and kind of people defending their territory and some local authorities think they have the, the right to be offering this as a service and not necessarily relating to other bodies. There's human factors of just things falling between stools. In the case of, I'm sure we'll come on to the kind of SDI, UKTI relationship, but there's a you know, there are, there are areas there which are not in any way 
nobody's doing it for the wrong reasons, but these things just just happen. So there's, you know, there's probably some bad reasons for the lack of coordination, but by and large, it's just habit and custom that there hasn't been enough pressure maybe to, to, to join them up. And that's where government has a role, is really to say, look, this has to happen. Uh, th this is the way it has to be done. And if these organisations are going to be part of the overall Scottish exporting effort, then they should buy into the concept of a, you know, an, an export Scotland uh, entity. I mean, some organisations, for instance, like the Chambers, think they're doing a good job and they're quite successful. Well, I mean, I, I, I think, if I remember rightly, I don't think I criticise anyone in the report for doing a, a, bad, a bad job, and uh, there's a real horses for courses element. I mean, I've seen trade uh, missions organised by probably the whole range of these uh, org organisations, and some have been very good and some have been a lot, a lot less good. But there's, I certainly, for instance, I've seen Aberdeen Chamber of Commerce uh, operating very effectively in the oil and gas a sphere. So there's not a, you know, there's not a kind of one, one is good and one is bad, but the, the, it's an historical legacy that they all exist, and the, what we really need is just to make sure that they're all serving the same, same functions. Well, thank you for that. Um, I'm quite sure we'll, we'll, we'll expand quite a bit uh, from uh, elements of review as we go on this morning. I'm going to bring in Chick Brodie first. Thank you. Good morning. In the, um, in your son, we get summary and indeed the report. <clears throat> One of the issues that's raised is access to finance as being the most significant barrier. Uh, having run export companies, I would contest that. There is a lack of culture uh, in market, just exporting culture, I would suggest, uh, and, and in terms of adapting and achieving local representation. How much time did you spend on looking at things other than finance in, in your report? Uh, well, I, I think probably a lot of time, and, and we, we met with a very wide range of companies, um, and uh, pretty much everything in the report is a reflection of what we heard, rather than any pre preconceived ideas. I think the distinction, uh, you know, I think I probably defined two fundamental problems. One is the, the relatively small num number of companies who come into exporting, and that is obviously something which SDI is, is trying to address. And the issue of finance, I think, is those who have crossed the threshold into, a, you know, saying, yes, we do want to become exporters and we have a market, but then finance kicks in as a, a problem. And, for instance, we met with the, the Bank of Scotland, who were exceptionally uh, open and honest about this and saying that, I suppose, in their kind of new uh, guise as part of the Lloyds Group, but compared to other parts of the Lloyds Group, that the Bank of Scotland had seriously underperformed as a supporter uh, of exporting, and they had a will to to change that. Uh, and similarly, I think that the work of um, previously ECGD, now um, British Export Finance, but that is, you know, I think that that has been far too narrowly restricted to some uh, sectors. So it was what we heard was that this that, that finding a financial support once once they had come into the exporting network, but just getting over the initial hurdle of exporting and factoring and all the other uh, elements that come into it, which make exporting a, a realistic prop proposition, um, that that was a serious problem for them. But in terms of a division of time, I mean, it, 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 it's, we, we, I think there's probably a list of the companies and organisations we spoke to, and it was, it was pretty e extensive. It just also conflicts. I had a meeting with one of the better chambers of commerce just last week who confirmed that finance was not a problem. The problem was how do we translate the need to export uh, and facilitate support to particularly small businesses. And just on that, um, one of the other things that your report highlighted was the shortage of skills, um, which is probably true. But then you go on to suggest that the universities and the colleges might run courses. I mean, running courses and, and you know, having skill shortages is not going to be fulfilled other than we transfer experience and indeed you know, transfer uh, intellectual property rights to some products that universities produce that could be exported but never reach the market. I mean, what makes you believe that we can, how can we transfer the knowledge of uh, current exporters or those that have been successful in exporting in the past? And also, what makes you believe that running courses is going to encourage people 
uh, to achieve and get to the market uh, as they need to. Well, one of the a, a recurrent theme in what we heard, particularly from a small businesses who wanted to become export porters was that mentoring is, an, is a very important part of the, the process. And where it works, it works well, where experienced exporters are prepared to pass on the skills and, the, and experience and to, whether for our own reasons, whether we're looking for um, subcontractors or, or whatever, or whether we're, you, you know, they have an interest in bringing companies in or whether we do it for purely, uh, you know, for, for uh, pro bono reasons, but where, where where mentoring does occur, it's a very much valued uh, facility for for the, the companies which which benefit from it. And as for the more formal transmission of skills through courses, well, I, I think that um, you know I think an underlying theme of the whole uh, report and and everything we heard is that there, there has to be a there has to be a bit of a culture change, and that if if you don't have a culture within which people think of exporting as a possibility and, and if you don't really have a, you know, if people aren't educated into the idea that, whether it's formally or informally educated into the idea that exporting makes business more interesting, more exciting, more profitable, more adventurous, then, you know, that's, that's, that is the culture change which I would like to see and which I think many companies could, could benefit from. But there's also, you know, so therefore that should be ingrained into any business courses or there should be exporting dimensions to any business courses in universities and colleges. But there's also an awful lot of um, you know, logistical skills which um, people need to learn. That, that, that one of the things I've learned from a kind of the sharper end of being in, involved in exporting is that it, you know, there are really, there's really complicated disciplines there of logistics, of, you know, of, of tariffs, of um, all sorts of obstacles to overcome to actually physically become an exporting company. And I, I, that would be if that were harnessed from, I mean, again, talking about the Chamber of Commerce, yeah. that those that have actually done it, felt it, got the T-shirt, uh, and, and encourage them to propagate the culture that's needed in terms of export. I don't see that coming from universities or, or certainly currently. Well, I don't see either approach being mutually exclusive. I mean, I would have thought that, that both is, of, um, both, both is of, of, of benefit. But, you know, there's... there's Courses that are an awful lot of things in universities and colleges, and I wouldn't, wouldn't have thought one that included the word exporting in the title would, is, would be a, anything other than a good. Okay. Well, Mr. Brody, can I bring you a <coughs> Alpine supplementary on this? This is a quick supplementary. Thank you, convener. You quite rightly mentioned the importance of mentoring, and we talked to a lot about that um, when um, SEC were in front of us last week. In your report, you talk about the, the, the narrow base of Scottish companies that do export, do you see it as a, a problem if you're trying to match up uh, companies with mentors that that narrow base means that there probably aren't enough around to be able to give the, the exporting expertise to up-and-coming companies and how would you see us overcoming that? Well, I, th I think there's something in that. Um, the, there are still, I mean, a lot of... Uh, uh, I kind of say a company in the textile sector can still advise a company in the food and drink sector on the essentials of exporting. It doesn't have to be, you know, within a sector. But um, I, I think I think I would take it more from the other end. I think if more companies and big companies and successful companies in general could be encouraged to mentor, there's still a lot of capacity within that to be to 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 be used. But um, I think the, the 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 problem with um, the narrow base is really that there's so many big sectors in Scottish exporting that the rest becomes pretty pretty marginal, and um, therefore uh, it's it's getting it's getting more companies either in the sectors which are underrepresented or you're never going to change the balance really because the, the big ones are so big, financial services, um, whisky, and uh, Oil, missed one, and, and oil and gas. I mean, these are the these are the kind of very big ones. But you know, the rest there's, there's plenty around the edges that could be could be doing it as well. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, back to Mr. Brody. Thank you. Um, two brief questions. What, one in in the summary, executive summary of your review, which is good reading, uh, for the most part, understandably, uh, you dwelt on what might have been or might, what might have happened to exports had the referendum decision been different. I'm not going to rehearse that. However, as part of a review, 
one would have thought when we look forward as to what alternatives might happen if, for example, we come out of Europe. What, uh, what's your view on that and how Scotland's export community should address that issue? Well, I think I put a number on it. I think I say there's 330,000 jobs in Scotland which are dependent on, expo on exporting to the European Union. I mean, if you ask me for a personal view, I think it would be bonkers to come out of Europe. But I think from, a, from the, the, the purposes of this review, I think that Scottish exporting would be, um, it would be extremely adversely uh, affected. And I've no doubt in due course, every company and every trade union which has a vested interest in the... Uh, in ensuring that jobs and prosperity are maintained, we'll say so. And one last very brief question. Uh, Scotland the brand, I mean, as you will be aware, there's a view that somehow we need to get a quite clear uh, branding of Scottish products. What's your view of the Made in Scotland brand? Well, I, th well, I think Scotland's a very strong brand in some sectors and in some markets, uh, and that should be reinforced and should be, should be widened. Uh, I, I think we're, you know, we're we have a hybrid identity in exporting. And if you if you take the, the company uh, or one of the things I'm involved in now, which is Harris Tweed, and obviously there are some places that Harris Tweed sells for being Scottish, it sells for being Hebridean, it sells for being British in the fashion market particularly, it sells. But above all, it sells as a heritage, you know, as a pro quality of product, a, pr a product of quality. And so, you know, that you can't say, look, this identity is what sells it or that identity is what sells it. You need, you need them all because there's different, uh, you know, different approaches in different, uh, in, in different markets. So I think that, I mean, I, I obviously support, you know, where, where it's appropriate. Some sectors in which the Scottish brand is very, uh, is, is very strong in tourism, uh, in whiskey, obviously, in, um, in food and drink. Um, there's some things there, but there's other bits where the fact that it's from Scotland doesn't really matter very much at all. So you should market it on the on what does sell it. And uh, you know, we sell, for instance, is Chanel. Chanel don't even name it as Harry. We don't use the label. We don't use the trade the trademark. We 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 sell it entirely on the basis of quality. So I think you shouldn't get hung up on which identity. It, again, it's whatever suits the product and suits the market best. That is the basis on which to to uh, to, to to sell it. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Brody. Uh, Lewis MacDonald. Very much. That leads us on very neatly, Brian, I think, to the question of how Scottish and British government uh, agencies responsible for promoting exports and trade, how they work together. And, and you've, you've said, you, you say some interesting things in your report. Over the piece, and given um, the, the, the things you found in your investigation, what, what's your view of the relationship as a whole, first of all? Do you, do you think... Broadly speaking, the relationship between UKTI and SDI particularly is, is positive and, func and, and functions as it's meant to do. Uh, I think broadly speaking, yes, I think it's positive. I think there's mutual respect between the, the organisations. Uh, I've seen them working very well uh, together. Uh, I've heard you know, British ambassadors you know, s singing the praises of SDI and saying you know, UKTI should be doing some of the things that... that STI does in, in these markets. Similarly, I've seen SDI calling on the services of, of UKTI. So I think there's a, you, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a broad synergy that works in many cases, but could undoubtedly work better. Uh, and it could work better in the markets, and it could work better at home. And these, these are some of the things I've signposted. And I think that um, this working group, which is now looking at that, I'm sure will, I think there's a recognition of it, uh, I think probably the political environment of the past few years hasn't been conducive to, you know, sorting these things out necessarily. And I think, you, you know, now that, that uh, up for purely commercial and trade reasons that, the, that these will, uh, that this will go forward well. In, in terms of the domestic, in the, the position for companies in Scotland considering exporting, there's sometimes, I think, and I think, again, you identify some evidence of companies not particularly being aware of the expertise of UKTI and where they function beyond the scope of, of, of what SDI works. What, what would your um, central recommendations be in terms of what UKTI could do better in the Scottish uh, market to promote its services to a potential exporter? Well, it, I mean, SDI for 
excellent reasons. It is, it's a very focused organisation and it's, it's got a matrix of markets and sectors. And if you fall within these markets and sectors, then SDI will, will almost certainly do a very good job for you. But it's a question of, it's a question of scale and range. And therefore, if you go that the, as a, for most uh, businesses, the first stop might be SDI. If they don't fall within the SDI category, we found some evidence that they didn't get referred uh, as they should do to, to, to UKTI. So that is one way in which a, a gap uh, exists. I mean, if you're, if you're trying to sell uh, a product in a market which SDI is not represented in, then obviously what should happen is that UKTI should, you should become, you should be at least referred to what UKTI can, uh, can offer. And the other thing is, which I, which I think there's a, I think there's both a kind of push and pull in this, is that a lot of the programmes that UKTI runs are underrepresented in the, in Scotland, and partly that's because that, for, that, that there's a kind of you, you, a UKTI perception that this is covered by SDI, and probably a slight push from Scotland saying, well, look, this is our territory, and you don't, we don't necessarily uh, want that programme here, but or we don't want to promote that programme here. So therefore, Scottish exporters become unaware of programmes from which they could benefit. So it's these, you know, it's, I'm, I'm not saying that these are the rule. I, I would like to think they're the exceptions to the rule, but obviously everybody can benefit if there is more synergy between the two, uh, between what both organisations have to, to offer. But I, I've emphasised in the report, and I, I do so again, that where what SDI does, it does very well. Uh, and therefore, it's a it's a case of improving the relationship rather than any criticism of SDI. That's very helpful. And, and, <coughs> and in overseas markets, one of the th things you you mentioned in your report is the fact that th there are some places around the world where SDI operate that they co-locate with UKTI or with British Trade Offices, and others where they do not. Do you think that is significant uh, in, in a general sense, or? Is it reasonable to, to say that in some markets co-location works better and, and in others it's not so important? I think co-location works well. Every, I think co-location works better everywhere than non-co-location. That's a word. Uh, it, um, but, so, it, so it makes complete sense. And for, for instance, um, just I think within the last year or so, uh, SDI opened an office in Rio and they did it in the UKTI premises. And that makes total total sense. I mean, and there wasn't much space and space was made and I think it's expanded and so, and I'm told now the relationship works very, very well. But if you've got physical distance, then you, it's much less likely that you've got a sharing of information. And I, I quote one example, you know, where a, your, your delegations, Scottish missions were coming in via SDI, a, which clearly would have benefited from contact with UKTI. There was not physical co-location and therefore, sometimes, you know, UKTI would hear after they'd gone, there'd been a Scottish mission in that they could have helped. Well, that's just silly. Uh, I, but so I think if you, if you, have, if you don't have co-location, then you're much more likely to have a, a them and us uh, atmosphere. It's very dependent also on personnel. You're dealing with very small numbers of people in these places. So if, if they're socialising, if they're talking to each other, then you're much more likely to have um, a good, good relationships. But if you get any kind of standoff, then it becomes territorial. So co-location, sharing of information, all of these things makes complete sense. Thanks very much. Happy with that. Thank you. Okay, before I move to Gordon MacDonald, um, Mr Wilson, you, you, you mentioned on a couple of occasions the, the working group um, that's been established. Um, who's leading that working group and who are the members? Uh, well, I'm, I've only been informed of it. It's not, I'm not um, a participating but my my understanding uh, from the Scotland office is that that working group has been set up involving SDI and UKTI uh, and I think the Scotland office I'm not too not too sure about that okay. uh, and also I think there's a formal UK government response being prepared to the review which would reflect the setting up of that working party it's something the committee can actually follow up on yeah. um, it just one of the obviously just following on from um, some of the aspects of the review one of the things you sort of look at is sort of leadership in this area uh, and it would have just been maybe quite good to know who was actually leading this but we can follow that up as a committee Gordon MacDonald thanks very much convener uh, I just want to continue on this theme that Lewis MacDonald had about um, 
the relationship between UKTI and SDI, and, and you said that you thought it worked relatively well. In your um, review of, my, of the Scottish exporting uh, situation, you actually highlighted that there's a London-centric approach to their overseas marketing by UKTI and other bodies, and this will require a conscious adjustment of mindset on the part of UK trade promoters. And last week at the evidence we heard from Professor Love, he actually said, from my experience of working with people at UKTI, I can say that they typically, typically regard trade support as having been devolved to the Scottish Government to administer through SDI, and that is pretty much it. He then continues, UKTI is ultimately responsible for government trade support and it has set aside a block grant for that activity and expects most of it to be dealt with by SDI. So, you know, since your report has uh, been produced in, what was it, 2010, has there been any change in that mindset? Well, the report just actually came out uh, well, last... The evidence, last I think, went back to 2010 yeah. that you took, yeah. It... Um, uh, well, I don't know. I think that's what they're working on, and I, th and, you know, I, I th don't uh, disagree with what uh, what you've just what you've just quoted. I think it's very variable. I mean, for instance, the the whole uh, oil and gas and infrastructure um, section of UKTI is based in between Glasgow and Aberdeen, so I mean, there's no there's no problem in, in that in that respect. I mean, there might be complaints from other parts of Britain about about that, but so there's no pro problem there. But I think the one, I can't remember if the quote you, you, you read was specific to a sector, but a good example is, a, is um, the Scottish financial sector. Now, um, I mean, I always, when I was trade minister, I, I always used to think it a bit odd that the Lord Mayor of London, who's the only unelected civic leader, if you can call him that, in the country, I mean, virtually is the status of um, trade ambassador. You know, and he trots off around the world promoting the city of London, which, which is fine. Um, but I, you know, I would obviously say there's no reason why there shouldn't be someone from the Edinburgh the, or the Scottish financial sector doing the same sort of job in the name of the, the UK. The two, it's all part of the one jurisdiction for for um, purposes of financial services. So um, I mean, that's the kind of, of of area where just again by habit and custom, it's it's grown up very much in in one way, but it has not taken enough recognition of the the fact that there are other centres of the same service in, which should also which should, which should be equally represented. And as I think you're, you're, you're talking more about changing a mindset than changing a, 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 a structure. But there should be push and pull in that because, you know, maybe SDI or maybe this committee or whoever should also be saying to, uh, to UKTI, you know, we want, we want Scottish financial services to be represented in every, in every part of the... The, the, the world. So I think it's, I mean, so I think if this report or these discussions serve a purpose, it's just to remind people, you know, that they, but, but, they're all, but, but the way things have been done are not necessarily the way they always uh, should be done, and that you, they need to be conscious of, um, of of wider responsibilities. As far as you, you I think that there is a, a, some of the assumptions that you refer to in in UKTI that that's been devolved, um, but. There, to be fair, I've also I, there are plenty of other people in UKTI and in the embassies around the world who are acutely aware that their obligations are to every part of the of the UK and that it hasn't been entirely devolved and and who go out of their way uh, to encourage um, trade missions and trade support which comes specifically to Scotland. Okay. Mm -hmm. Richard Lyle, supplementary on that. No, no, it's an entirely separate question. Okay, Thank you. thanks. Okay, Gordon, continue. Right, thanks very much, Kimia. Um UKTI, how, how effective do you think do you think it is as an organisation? Um, I'm looking at a report that was produced by the EU called "Supporting the Internationalisation of SMEs," and in it, it states that um, that. In terms of exporting, there is considerable scope for improving the performance of UK SMEs. And it states that of the 27 countries in the EU, 21% um, of SMEs in the UK export as compared to an EU average of 25%. And when I actually looked at percentage of internationally active SMEs that use financial or non-financial support, 
the UK had 5% of exporters that had gained financial support as opposed to Austria and Turkey who had 47 and 32% effectively. And using non-financial support, uh, only 5% of exporters used non-financial support, excuse me, <clears throat> in comparison to Slovenia on 23% and Cyprus on 19 So how effective do you think UKTI is as an organisation? Uh, I think like all such organisations, there's strengths and there's weaknesses within it, and you've probably really illustrated one of them. I mean, I think particularly when uh, under ECGD, that um, export credit uh, finance was far too heavily geared towards a, a very narrow uh, sectoral base, uh, and that uh, I think that the kind of revamping of, of UK of, of ECGD into British export finance is a conscious effort to redress that and they have set aside um, quite a large budget for for supporting SMEs and they also have people rep based in Scotland embedded within SDI which I think is another uh, in, in innovation so I think there's an awareness that it has to extend but uh, but historically there's no doubt at all that the but ECGD was very closely geared to, um, to, to the defence sector and probably to the major infrastructure sector rather than to the needs of SMEs. And uh, I think that is something that is reflected in these statistics and needs correcting. OK, thanks very much. Mr Brody, you've got a supplementary on this? Yeah, quickly, I may follow on that. Um, <laughs> I have the privilege of being a European reporter on this committee. <coughs> and on a visit to, um, to Brussels, found that... Uh, in terms of just following on Gordon's excellent expose, in terms of the contribution of SMEs, that Scotland was not fully aware of the COSME programme, which is 2.3 billion euros for investment in small businesses, the Horizon 2020, and does not have a small business envoy, yet the UK does, but there's been absolutely no communication. And I have to say the people in Brussels weren't particularly impressed by their engagement on the small business side. And yet what you're saying is... <coughs> Previously, the ECGD uh, had, as I understand it, a, a reasonable reputation. W we're missing out on, on engagement with with large markets because we hey, because we're not a member state, but um, because there's this lack of communication, which you know, one gets a flavour of it's you know the garden's rosy. No, it's not. Well, well like I guess I mean communication is two way, and um, that there, there should oh, be. From, the, from our aspect, recently, but there was nothing coming out of the way. Well, I'd be sur I'd be surprised at that, and I'd be surprised if the if the role of the working party, which is following through on, on this report, uh, didn't address these. I'm sure we'll we'll read your comments, and we'll we'll uh, it's exactly the kind of area where we're, there has to be a, a sharing of information. I mean, you know, one of the the areas which I, I mentioned is the the High Value Opportunities Programme, um, which is absolutely critical. Um, now, that re requires... Now, that is clearly can be... is conducted on a, U on a UK basis. And, and I mean, I, mean, I don't want to get into the politics of this at all, but UK, if you're looking at very major contracts in places of the world, then the, U the, the UK can um, make a sub substantial effort there. But, but the, the importance of, of these opportunities is that there is then a cascade down to subcontractors and sub subcontractors all the way down and literally thousands of companies can be involved out of one a uh, high value um, opportunity now what i was concerned about in the report was whether that, that in the information about these high value opportunities is sufficiently a uh, shared around the, the the country so that you know, so that Scottish companies or indeed companies in any part of the UK that they are aware of the, the potential from that single contract which is being pursued at a, a, at, at, a, at a UK level. So in exactly the same way, if there are European programmes um, which UKTI are aware of um, but are not sufficiently being rolled out in Scotland, then that is a structural deficiency which should be addressed. Thank you very much. Hey, can I bring in uh, Joanne Lamont, please? Yeah. Thanks very much. Um, I'm interested in whether, you know, government is a help or a hindrance in this. Is the fact that we've got a Scottish government in Scotland office, obviously over the last period, they've been largely in conflict with each other. Do you perceive them in this regard in competition 
and that, is that detrimental and is there evidence of that cooperation developing um, rather than it being the UK government, Scottish government, but actually a shared interest in supporting business? Well, again, what I, I tried, I wrote this report at a time of political sensitivity, let's say, and what I was trying not to do was to make it attract you know, uh, which, and, and I would hope therefore the report has as much relevance now as it would have done uh, before uh, last last September. I mean, it, it is it is straight, straight down the middle, and therefore the, the deficiencies which I uh, identified um, uh, were there um, throughout that the, the period that we were taking evidence, and they're still there, there to be addressed. So I don't think there was ever a point at which. Um, SDI at a professional level had a standoff with UK UKTI, uh, and I don't think there was, you know, probably a conscious a uh, problem which arose out of the the constitutional dis disagreements. On the other hand, common sense would suggest that it was not a time conducive to maximum cooperation, and there were points being made about Scotland should be doing this and Scotland should be doing that, and you know, maybe there was a mind, uh, an attitude that we, we don't, we want to do them separately rather than together. Now, you know, you're dealing with human elements there and personal views, but in some respects, that probably did affect the last few years. There's no reason for it to affect, affect it now. And the issues which I identified are exactly the same now as they were before uh, se September. And any sensible person looking at this subject a uh, must come to the conclusion um, that it is better to, to take the strengths of both organisations. If there was a different constitutional setup, then Scotland would have a different kind of trade set trade setup. I would have argued that it would not be as good a one as we have we have potentially, because what we have just now is representation in every corner of the world. But clearly, now we're in this uh, the, the situation for the time being, at least, is clarified. Therefore. It makes total sense for Scottish business to take advantage of both um, the Scottish setup, which is good and is focused, and to take advantage of the UK setup, which is good and is much more broadly based. It's as simple as that. There is maximum interest in cooperation rather than in any kind of conflict. I suppose I'm interested in the way in which government can sometimes inhibit um, business in, in I mean, uh, somebody who doesn't really believe particularly in the free market as a philosophy, but it does feel sometimes that business survives despite government rather than because of it. Um, I suppose if there is a one thing that government any level should be doing to support businesses to export, what would it be? Is it this single portal? Is it the mentoring and being consistent or is there something else? Well, the, I don't think there's one particular thing and I think the single, I think the single portal is something that's, that government can drive. That what every, um, a, you know, every document says is you want more companies to be exporting um, and I think there are very specific targets set by the by the Scottish government now therefore you know a numbers game matters here now increasing the number of um, of companies which are exporting it doesn't necessarily it won't necessarily make a huge incremental difference to the value of, of exports because a lot of them will be very small exporters but it's important for every one of these business and every one of these uh, communities so therefore, it is a, if you're going to meet these numbers, numbers targets, it's essential that it's made, not easy, but made achievable for these companies. And we repeatedly heard, and it's supported by my own experience, is that people just don't know where to go. It's too confusing for them to get into exporting to start with. So they say, well, let's, we'll put it aside for an, another day. So instead of a kind of ethos of, hey, this, let's get doing this, let's really uh, get a push behind this, let's give it a go, there's one of saying, well, for heaven's sake, we went and we saw X and they pushed us along to Y and Y said, well, we don't deal with that, but you can go to Z. You know, I mean, it is, for many companies, that has been the experience. I mean, not over five years or 15 years, but over 50 years, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's one of it, exactly the same complaints would have been found when, no matter when this, uh, when this report was being done. So as I say, you know, I've heard the one-stop one shop line so often that I was very conscious of the need to avoid it. Um, but there, so I came up with another cliche instead. Maybe just f finish yeah. one last point because I think you know that makes sense that people go through the one system, and I think what you say about being honest with people 
well, you can do X, but you shouldn't do Y, probably kind of uh, makes sense. But I wonder whether there is also a case for, you, you talked about the conflict with local authorities, perhaps thinking they have a role in other organisations, that for small businesses within a very local area, actually, for example, a city-driven um, export model to support companies would make sense. But given your own experience, um, maybe Harris Tweed is slightly different because people more than folk in the Western Isles get it. But there must be elements of, you know, in very rural, remote areas, which would be better supported by a more local um, business support. I wonder how you think that fits in with this idea of a single portal. Well, I think it fits in fine. The, the, the issue is that everybody knows what everybody else is doing. I mean, where it becomes daft is is if you've got an SDI mission arriving in Moscow the same week that there's a UKTI mission, because they're not both they're not both going to be seeing the right people. One of them is, and I'll put my bottom dollar. It will be the UKTI one, which which does. So it's about coordination, much more about coordination than <laughs> um, you know saying somebody shouldn't be doing it. I mean, I'm a great believer in the city model, and I've I've seen Glasgow and Aberdeen, you know, both working very, very effectively in in in, in this field. I wouldn't want to shut out Glasgow or Aberdeen and say there should be some Scotland wide or UK wide approach. But what I would say is that they should, Glasgow should be working with SCDI, SGDI should be working with SDI, SDI should be working with Chambers of Commerce. Everybody should know what everyone else is doing, and there should be coordination. And that doesn't seem, I mean, it doesn't seem beyond the realms of human possibility to, to achieve that. But in practice, wherever I would go, whether it was as trade minister or subsequently, uh, I would hear these horror stories about delegations arriving in places for no particular reason, embassies or, or consulates not really knowing what to do with them. And by the way, there was a mission in last week doing exactly the same thing. Now, that's just stupid. Um, but it's extremely difficult. It's been extremely difficult to address. So if it can be addressed through this, then we'll have achieved one small step for humankind. Okay, thank you. Lewis McDonald, you got a brief supplementary? Yeah, briefly. Just uh, we we heard a couple of weeks ago about SCDI having previously run programmes with support from Scottish government, and and that that had not been renewed recently. I wonder if you've a view on the. I think you mentioned Aberdeen Chamber as a very effective export agency um, uh, in terms of supporting uh, companies there. Do you have a view on the r role of SCDI and, and the Chambers? Is, is I think you've partly answered in your last answer that you the, the critical thing is mutual communication. Um, is there a need for closer private-public collaboration uh, in planning and, and, and organising things like trade missions and uh, export promotion? Yes, I mean, it's, it's about it's coordination and not and not, not about shutting any, anybody out. But SCDI has got a very distinguished pedigree and clearly is going to carry on as a, a as a body which promotes exports. I mean, it's the only one that actually depends on the you know the support of, of it's, it's a membership based organisation. So if nobody wanted it, it wouldn't be there. Uh, and it, it it also tends to adopt a more multi-sectoral approach to, uh, to, to, to trade missions. Um, so I, I think it's got a role, but it, and I don't see why SC, SDI wouldn't franchise some of its work on trade missions and so on to a, 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 a SCDI. But the main thing is, co is coordination and not, a, not duplication on, and not reinventing the wheel. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Thank you very much, convener. Um, morning, Brian. Brian Wilson, long political career, energy trade minister, knows the working of government uh, inside out, I, I would say, in the uh, illustrious career that you had. Um, you've said that, you know, export Scotland. So we're going to make you the chairman of the, of the time of Export Scotland. What does Export Scotland need to do? Do we need a separate HQ? Where, who would be based there? Who, who would you pull in in order to gel all these people together? Because you're correct. Everybody's working in their own wee silos. Nobody's getting, you know, getting the message. Some companies want to export but, but can't because they're, they're facing all these different places they're going. And uh, we all know how government works. Uh, you know, we all know how councils work. And a lot of good chambers of commerce... But I totally agree with the point you made earlier. One trade mission comes one week and one comes the next week and none of the two of them know what's happening. 
And also, we've got loads of embassies, you know, we're in the UK, we've got loads of embassies throughout the world, you know, what would you do to establish this, and how much do you think it would cost to run it? Well, as I said at the start, I mean, I was very... You, you know, if, you, if you're addressing the problem with too many organisations, you don't want to come up with a solution of creating another one. Um, so I, I was wary of that in, in saying export Scotland. So what I would, I, I would not suggest a separate headquarters or a separate staff or a separate budget for something called export Scotland. But I, I would do it by reconfiguring the resource that you have already and putting an additional responsibility. I, I suppose it has to be on SDI. But what I, I do say in the report is it should be ministerially led, um, that it should be, you know, it should be a, there should be a calling to account in it that, uh, that this is actually being done. Um, and so, so I don't want to create another bureaucracy in, or, in order to do this. I, what, what, what would be your overall strategy then? To well, drive on, this, on this narrow to point, drive this forward. On the narrow point, my my overall strategy would be for the Scottish government minister, who is responsible for trade, uh, to say to SDI, "Look, this is a priority. I want you to do this. I want to get rid of this long-standing problem of duplication and uh, confusion." from the person for the, for the business entering the system. It's an absolute priority. It's your job. We're going to give, call it Export Scotland so that in every local government area in Scotland, let's say, uh, there is a place, there is a sign-up saying Export Scotland. That's where you go if you want to start to export. And there's somebody sitting there who will put you on to the most appropriate starting point. And I think that can be done without creating the bureaucracy of another organisation, but by, use it, by utilising the the resources that are already in place. I, I had the good fortune uh, some months ago to go on a, 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 a visit to Taiwan, paid for by the Taiwanese government, and and we went to we met a Scottish, basically uh, SDI chap. He was there, but he had to cover the whole. Of, yes, yes, yeah, you know him well. I know him well. He had to cover the whole of China, basically down to Thailand, yeah. Japan. You know, one guy. You know, trying to to push, you know, Scottish and 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 the main thing that was pushing was was, was a, 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 a Scottish whisky, you know, but you know, doing an excellent job, but basically said, I really need help, I need more people, uh, you know. So should should we look at the, the areas we are involved in and and give more help to those areas in order to so that they can go out and see more companies and what sort of cost would that be? Well. I think you should, I mean, there, there are, I don't think you'd be covering China. I mean, I think, SD, well, SD, I know SDI have offices in China, and I think there are plans for more offices in, in China. I mean, Taiwan's a great example, actually. I know Taiwan quite well. But when, when I was a Scottish industry minister in uh, 97, 98, I had quite a lot to do with Taiwan, because at that time, 90% of um, Taiwanese investment into Europe came to the UK, and 90% of Taiwanese investment into the UK came to Scotland because there was a cluster of Taiwanese businesses and there was a terrific ambassador, he wasn't called an ambassador for political reasons in Taiwan a guy called Alan Collins who was a brilliant trade ambassador and who was fully bought into a, that, 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 that approach so that was a, great, that was a big, great example of a, of a, a British embassy in all but name um, you know, being very, very productive for, um, for for Scotland. So I would say, and it's also a very big market for, for Scotch whisky and for, for some other uh, Scottish exports. So I would say that's an, a really good example of somewhere where you, you utilise the resources of the embassy and you have somebody, you maybe you have more than one Reggie Wu, maybe you have, you have two or three people, maybe you have a stronger Scottish team, but you're working closely with the, 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 the embassy. So... It, it's, it's a really good example of where we can maximise the, 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 the bang for the buck and also the benefits for Scottish business by a coordinated approach between the two presences eh, in, in, in Taiwan. I would be very sympathetic for, I, I think, that any one person trying to cover regions is almost by definition wasting their time because it's just a, 
It's a, it's a, to, it's a tokenistic presence. And, and I think Scottish SDI recognise that because that, they have this focused approach on certain uh, markets. Hey, one, one more uh, question. So basically, just to round it up, uh, led by a Scottish Minister, uh, basically everyone feeding into that to, to ex export Scotland and, and basically driving this forward and, and possibly we, we could get our, uh, a lot of bang for our buck. On the on the coordination side of it and the the portal approach, that is that is what I would uh, I'd recommend and I'd make it a, a priority just to clarify it. I mean, the, as I say, it's a, it's a, it's it's one point. I mean, if you looked at the I, I haven't done this, but I'm having a guess. If you looked at the telephone directory now, and you wanted to know where to start exporting, yeah, I don't. I would you know would you know where to go? Um, whereas, you know among all the other uh, organisations which now have Scotland after the name, why not one for exporting? And there will be under E, export, every local authority area in Scotland. That's where you go. It doesn't seem to me overcomplicated. Thank you very much, Kenya. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wonder, uh, Mr Wilson, uh, you were a Scottish Minister in 1997-98, but uh, you were back in the DTI in 2002. Did you hold the views then in 2002 that you have now and if so, did you try and um, a, influence the direction that you've actually um, put down in your report? A this collaboration, cooperation. Well, I did. Yeah, I think I, I think I probably did. A, I was involved. I was trade minister at the time that UK, UKTI was being set up. It replaced the British Overseas Trade Board. A, I had a lot of dealings with UKTI in uh, Glasgow and Aberdeen um, through oil and gas and, and uh, the other things that, that they, they, they did there. Um, on the specifics, I, to be honest, I can't remember whether, you know, this, the, the thing about, the whole thing about the coordination, the, the, the portal approach, I probably didn't uh, when I was in the, in the, in the Scottish office. Um, but my, of using this have obviously developed over the years, and particularly as trade ministers traveling abroad and and actually seeing, you know, you know gaining, gaining some experience uh, of it. Basically, if uh, some of the review was based on obviously your previous experience uh, as a minister, and whether or not those frustrations um, came out in this review uh, from when you were a minister, but it was something maybe you didn't take forward at the time, but wish you had. Well. Yeah, I'd like to think I took some of it uh, forward at the time, but I would be, I would not claim omnipotent. Can we, can we move to Joan McAlpine, please? Thank you very much. Um, Mr Wilson, and, um, I think in the, the challenges and responses part of your, um, of your report, you talk about um, <coughs> air, air links and the need for better air links, and I think we're all in agreement on that. You don't look at surface transport or, or sea links or ports, and I wondered if there was a reason for that. Uh, no, I, 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 it probably wasn't one that was raised as 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 as, as much with us. I'm not sure how um, I'm not sure how much of an issue uh, it's it's seen as. I mean, obviously, I'm kind of in favour of as many communications direct from Scotland as as possible. But for instance, I mean, all of if we go back to the Harris Tweed thing, but everything that leaves the UK, leaves through ports in the south. Um, it's, it's maybe not ideal, but it's, uh, it, it's established procedure. If there were, if there were sea links, um, if there were more cargo options from, from Scotland, I've no doubt over time that, that could change. But I think that the history is it's been quite difficult to sustain that. Sure. That's what I wanted to explore because we've, we've had submission to the inquiry from Professor Alf Baird, who's a professor of maritime business at Edinburgh Napier University. And one of the points that he makes in, in his submission is that the United Nations Trade Agency argue that seaports have a, a, a specific facilitation uh, role in encouraging uh, trade. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you've alluded to that in your, your comments there. I mean, I wasn't uh, able to join my colleagues when we visited um, ports as part of this inquiry, but understand that fr from what Professor Beard's saying is that um, that this lack of a direct 
port connection it is holding us back and the quality of the ports is holding us back as well. Well, I'm very happy to defer on on that. I mean, I think it was. I think when I referred to Airlinks, it was it was less for freighting than for personal com communication for business communication. Yeah. But I've certainly no. Uh, I wouldn't for a moment contradict or disagree sure. with what. Uh, yeah, and one of the things that he talks about is a very unusual situation that's existed since the um, two Tory governments ago under Margaret Thatcher, where the ports were were privatised and they also have a monopoly. So you have these private companies that are owned by private equity based overseas who are controlling our main ports and taxing the people who use them. Uh, it's like almost like a private tax, uh, which he argues is, is really holding back uh, business and needs to be addressed as a matter of urgency. Is that something that you, anyone's ever raised with you? Or? No. I mean, we're, we're not all. I mean, Clydeport isn't owned by foreign equity. And I mean, certainly Clydeport... I know that I mean, Greenock is still a big exporter of of, of, of Scottish goods, but whiskey, I think, quite a lot, quite a lot else. But I don't, I, do, I, I, to be honest, it's not something that I know, I know much about. Right. Thanks very much. Okay. Thanks. Hey, Gordon. Yeah. Just to continue <laughs> this theme, um, my understanding is that EU transport policy permits member states to co-finance, as they refer to it, motorways of the seas. And there is tendering and subsidy options that have been taken up by Spain, Ireland, Denmark and Italy along those those lines. And certainly the information that was provided by Professor Baird highlighted that Scottish ports handle about £8.1 billion worth of uh, freight compared to Ireland's two main ports of Dublin and Belfast, which um, has £90 billion worth. So, you know, has, has the existing situation that my colleague John McAlpine referred to where um, the UK government has withdrawn from uh, ports, uh, uh, managing ports or, or um, regulating ports and given, given it effectively over to the, the market and it's predominantly going through the likes of Tilsbury, etc. Has that been of benefit to Scotland and is, should Scotland have its own maritime policy? Well, I'd be in favour of promoting Scottish ports, but um, the, I mean, the ports are privately owned and run and, and, and are and live or die by their commercial success. I mean, my guess would be that... Um, that the use of these ports has probably gone up rather than down in, in recent years. I mean, Clyde, Clyde Port was sort of sleepy hollow for a, lo a long time, and I think it's probably got a much more dynamic management now than it did uh, when, it, when it was a trust port. Um, it's about, I suppose it's about geographical location to a, to a large extent, that, I mean, if you're, and, and cost. Um, I guess it's more economic. I'm not saying it should be more economic, but I guess it is more economic uh, to... Uh, to, to freight the, for instance, our product to Tilbury or wherever uh, and, and have a short sea crossing to Europe than it is to, um, a, you know, to do it di direct from, Scot from a Scottish port. Or presumably if it wasn't, then a, a market opportunity would have been taken. I think part of the problem may well be that, especially on the East Coast, where obviously we're closer to the continent, um, that it would appear that fourth ports have been starving uh, the, the, the likes of Grangemouth of investment. I mean, we did a tour recently um, of Grangemouth and it is in a pretty dire uh, state. And when I asked the question what capital investment it was, I was told two or three million pounds a year, which strikes me as a pittance. And I think we've allowed the market to um, allow the likes of Grangemouth to wither on the vine a bit. And we had certainly heard that from one of the um, freight companies that we visited as well, that they asked for additional investment to be put into Grangemouth to make the whole operation more efficient, and it was rejected. So I, th I think something has to happen, otherwise the likes of our East Coast ports are going to suffer. So a queue for another inquiry. <laughs> <laughs> I think ICI is doing yeah. that already. <laughs> uh, a very, very brief supplementary, Mr. Rudy. Yes, just again, going back to the European thing, 26.2 billion euros available for port development. 
connection with Scotland and Europe, nothing. We've got to go through the UK, and it, it's a disgrace. Anyway, just coming back to the universities and the colleges, I mean, you suggested courses. What role do you think, given the huge uh, capabilities of Scotland's universities uh, <coughs> and, and, and in developing new technologies, new products, they seem not to be able to transfer these either directly to the market or indeed take up positions in in the in the growing markets. What should be? What do you think the, the university should be doing to transfer their skills and their capabilities as, if you like, a, a Scottish entrepot to the major market? Well, I, the universities themselves, I, th I think, could be. We, we never, probably every university now has campuses um, outside of Scotland. Um, they have ca campuses in the Middle East, they have campuses in China, they have activity going on all over the world. And I think that there's an opportunity there for a, for, for a synergy between uh, their presence there and the promotion of, uh, of, of, of other exports. I mean, education in itself is a big export, but there can also be a, there could also be a, a tie in there. Uh, I agree with you. I, th I think there's a disappointing record on um, spin-off spin companies. Um, turning into a successful exporters, and I think that's something that you probably SDI, I'm sure, is very aware of, and can can, can could be working with the uh, the universities to um, to try to encourage more of them. But when, once they do, they turn into freestanding companies that they should be looking at international markets as well, because by and large they would be in the new technologies, and therefore they would be opening up, they would be broadening the range of. Um, of, of potential Scottish uh, ex exports, but I just think I think that the, the universities probably do have a big part to play in just changing the culture of this. That they're internationalising themselves, and therefore they should be helping society to think more in terms of uh, of, of, of international trade. I mean, the, the other um, just in terms in terms of courses and, and the kind of the academic approach to it. And I, I know at times um, coming to an end. So I, I, I just want you know. To say that, I mean, there's another side. Everything we've talked about, quite reasonably, is about trade promotion, but the 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 other side of it is trade diplomacy, um, which is particularly for Scotland is immensely uh, important. And it, I mean, it's 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 because it's, our ability to export is conditioned by the the relationships with other countries and our representation through international trade bodies and so on. And again, that's something in which. In most embassies of the world, you would find you'd certainly find Scots involved in trade promotion and in the a, in trade diplomacy. But it's something which it's a very separate discipline. It's a very particular discipline, and uh, it would be no bad thing if we were, you know, if we had a cadre of, of people uh, who were who were very aware of the very complex uh, issues involved in in the global regulation of trade. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rory. Uh, can I bring in the very very patient Mr. Harvey? Thank you, convener. Uh, good morning. I wanted to, to touch on a few issues around the context in which international trade takes place. Um, some people will always see this as a question of just more of everything, please. Uh, you used the phrase a few minutes ago, uh, I hope not tongue-in-cheek, uh, a small step forward for humankind. Uh, I'd like to think that most of us would hope that international trade actually has a wider benefit than just how much money is being made by people in this country, but something that can raise up uh, everybody's experience in terms of environmental standards, uh, labour standards, uh, social justice uh, around the world, as well as development in, in developing countries. And yet, some of the countries which the Scottish <coughs> Government identifies as emerging high-opportunity markets, such as China, India and the Middle East, some of these will be places where uh, Scottish countries developing an international presence will find it very difficult to achieve, for example, uh, decent labour standards in their supply chain, uh, decent uh, human rights and, and basic uh, social protections for their employees who are sent to these, these areas, whether in terms of gender, sexuality, religion or uh, other protected characteristics that they're used to, to seeing some protection for in this country. They may be markets where corruption is more common than in this country, or where those country, where those companies are, shall we be generous and say, drawn into uh, complex mechanisms for avoiding paying tax. Uh, what is the re the responsibility of 
government, either at UK or Scottish level, and the support services that they put in place to engage with those ethical, social and environmental criteria uh, and encourage companies to uh, take a proactive uh, response to those issues? I think the responsibility in government is very strong. Um, and uh, I think the corporate responsibility is also very should weigh heavy upon them, and I think, to be fair, does uh, upon most, uh, certainly major companies which are in involved in these kind of projects. I think the attitude to corruption is probably very different to what it was 20 years ago, maybe even more recently as a result of the of legislation. I mean, there's I mean, no uh, British company involved in overseas trade is under any illusion now that they... they um, that if they engage in, in if, they, if, if they're prepared to participate in corruption, that they're not just breaking the law of the, the host country, but they're also breaking the law of this country. Uh, and I think that I think there is a probably a cultural change uh, that has been driven by that. Um, and again, I think that uh, every response, every responsible employer, every co company in this country which is bound by um, health and safety legislation and human rights legislation should apply the same standards in the, the markets they're operating in. And if that puts... If that specific example, uh, yeah. are you aware of anything that UKTI or SDI or uh, either governments do uh, in terms of engaging with a company that's developing trade links with China to ensure yeah. basic labour standards in its supply chain? A I would imagine that the, I know that embassies are very aware of these considerations and would um, certainly be would certainly issue codes of practice and guidance that if a, if a company was going to benefit from the support of a British embassy um, or from UKTI, then they would be expected to maintain the standards of international regulation. UKTI issues codes of practice on that issue. Uh, I would be pretty sure of it. I can't speak for UKTI, but I would be very surprised if they if they didn't. And they, and this would certainly issue in in country guidance on the prevailing standards and the expectations. It might be useful, convener, if we could seek confirmation of that, and if if such codes exist, perhaps get a copy yeah. of them before we uh, con conclude the, the, the yeah. inquiry. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Patrick. Uh, Mr. McDonald, uh, is Lewis McDonald, Global Scott. Thanks, Dennis. And, and uh, before I come to Global Scott, just, just I, I guess for completeness of the record, it's, you'll be aware, Brian, that Aberdeen Harbour is a trust port, very dynamic and successful one, which is not inhibited in accessing funds either from Europe or elsewhere in terms of its expansion uh, plans uh, and is a major uh, exporting port. Um, in terms of Global Scott, and you were talking a moment ago about the importance of embassies uh, engaging uh, with uh, exporters and informing them about the local situation and, and, and uh, expectations. In, in, in your review, I think you found, I think it's fair to say you found that Global Scots, it was a good idea, it was a good network, it sometimes works exceptionally well, but also it's, it's mixed in, in its findings. What would your recommendations be in order to make it work even better, or to make the rest come up to the standard of the best. Oh, well, you're right. It was probably the most complete curate's egg that uh, I encountered. I mean, some people had great experiences, some people had awful experiences, and it speaks for itself. But what you have to do is just keep sifting the list, and um, inevitably, a list like that uh, it starts off with the good and the great, and people who say they want to do it, and then the question mark is whether they've actually done anything or whether they've done it well in the interim period, uh, and it just needs a a check on 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 that, which does which does happen. Maybe it should happen more rigorously. But um, it's, it's it's a really good idea. It's back to the mentoring uh, argument that um, if you've got somebody in a market who was not only a source of knowledge but also a source of encouragement, source of contacts, then you couldn't ask for anything better. Um, but if you place faith in that sort of contact and then it doesn't deliver, then it's a big. Um, blow to morale so it's it's not the, the principle of it's very very good and the it's purely the execution and that depends on the feedback of whether people are do, doing the you're doing fulfilling the role a uh, well or whether they're fulfilling the role at all there's no point in them being there in name if they're not doing it so i'm sure 
SDI are awa aware of that, or I think there is a global Scots organisation, and it's just a case of just keep saying, well, thanks very much for your services, but we're, we're bringing in a few new people. That's really what it's about. If, if you'd been undertaking a report on UK export services rather than specifically Scotland, which I know your focus is, would, would you um, have recommended in that report, do you think, um, that something like Global Scots would have a wider application? Is it something in which uh, Scotland has a, a market advantage in UK terms and uh, would other, others do well to learn from it? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, I think there is a, I think there is a kind of ethos of I think Scottish people abroad very often want to to help um, you know someone coming, trying you know trying to emulate what what they have done. Uh, I'm sure it would be, it could it could be be replicated, and of course there's also cross currents. There'll be plenty of people, not necessarily Scottish people, who would provide the same service. I mean, it's it's not a, it's it's not it's not peculiar to Scotland. But it's the same thing. I mean, I've got this title of you know, British UK business ambassador role, but they have exactly the same thing as, and, and they do weed them out because if you're not doing anything, there's no point in carrying the title. Um, and, and I think that's a, a sound general principle. So in a sense, there is something that's parallel, uh, although it's not quite the same, but the UK business ambassador has similar functions. It's not quite the, no, the, the, sure, the, the same. Sure, sure. Can I ask one other thing on, on <coughs> the question, again, that I think comes up in your report around ministerial engagement with visits both inward and outward uh, and I think particularly in relation to whiskey there were some issues around whether that was as coordinated as it might be. Is that something that you would hope the joint working between UK, TI and SDI might be looking at or is it something that would need to be taken forward at a political level? Uh, well I, I think it's, um, it's maybe something not just the trade organisations, I think it's the it's at government level, but that has to be take, taken. You know, that has to be considered. I mean, it is very important on these missions that, uh, or you know, on serious missions that the, that it is led by somebody who has the status to deliver leverage uh, in the in the market. I mean, if you and that's what this business ambassador role does as as, as well. Is it, I mean, rightly or wrongly? I mean, they don't. I mean, if I arrive as a UK business ambassador, they don't know me from Adam, but they probably don't know the minister from Adam either, so it doesn't make a lot of difference. But if you've got the status to, to do it, then you, you, you create serious leverage that wouldn't occur if there wasn't someone who was recognised as a leader of that, as a, as a qualified leader of, of, of that mission. So it's very important is that ministers do it where they can deliver value, and if they don't do it, then there's somebody of comparable status there who can... A, do it and again there's no point in duplication you know that there's, it, it should be coordinated and the resources should be used in the most a, if, if effective way but it is I mean that's important to the I mean you've got to remember that businesses some of them without a huge amount of money to spend that they do commit if they send someone to on one of these missions they're sending someone away for a week they're paying them they're paying the costs of this they're not interested, uh, you know, serious people aren't interested in sort of trade tourism. They want outcomes from that and therefore a government um, in whatever form, and they don't distinguish, government in whatever form has a duty to perform, to deliver a serious uh, service to them. And that means creating access, creating links with potential partners, introducing them to the, the right people and so on. So it's very, you know, these, these things are important and the, the leadership of a, of a mission like that is, is significant. Something that ministers in both governments should be coordinating in a, in a coherent way and in a way that addresses specific markets. Absolutely. There's no point in two ministers from whatever government, and this would also apply to the other devolved administrations. It's just crazy to have two ministers in town from the same state eh, in, in the same week or the same month. You actually said in your report, uh, Mr Wilson, that the Scottish office are well placed to sort of bridge this um, area of uh, between the, the UK government and the devolved administration, that being Scotland in this case. Um, is it still your opinion that the Scottish Office should be leading this? I don't necessarily think it should be leading it, but... Um, but they're, they're, they're best placed to do yeah. this. Well, I, I said they're best placed to provide a, a bridge, yeah. and I think they've done that and are continuing to do it really by... They did it by 
initiating this report, and then they've done it by bringing together the SDI and UKTI to take to take it forward. Um, I mean, I'm probably in a fairly small minority in this room and thinking that the Scotland Office has it. If you accept that, if, in the, if you have a de facto um, constitutional situation, there is. I think the Scotland Office is, should be important to, to to Scotland because it should be representing a Scottish interest, um, just as the Scottish Office did in the past in those areas which uh, where, where, where where it's required. And I do think actually that this is an area where it could um, a, perform a, a useful role as. A coordinating body, if you if, if if you if you like, whether it does that, whether it is it is the only occupant of that role or not, isn't for me to 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 say. But I, I certainly wouldn't try to exclude it because it's we are dealing to a substantial extent here about improving the relationship be, or, or sophisticating the relationship between a Scottish body and a Scottish government body and a UK government body, and that needs someone to make sure that that's always working in the best possible way. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, I'm getting conscious of time. Uh, Richard Lyle, you've got a brief... Uh, uh, thank you, Kinsey, and I'll try to be brief, brief. The Scottish Government wants to increase the value of exports. We all know that. We're currently at a base of £23 billion, I think, in 2010. You've done a report, Mr Wilson, an excellent report. What progress uh, to date has been, been made on the recommendations of your report? And if all the recommendations in your review were Im implemented... Do you think that a 50% increase in exports uh, aimed for by the Scottish Government can be achieved on the time scale set? Uh, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying this about in this specific context, I'm, I'm not a great man for target setting. You know, I mean, I've, I've never really seen the point of it because the only point of setting targets is that refer to something that applies once you're gone. You know, nobody, and nobody ever goes back and, and checks, you know. Uh, so, I wouldn't put numbers on it. I just think if the right things are done, then you maximise the, the opportunities. You know, you maximise. You, you know, I think it's absolutely right to try to increase the number uh, coming in. I think you have to recognise if you increase the numbers of exporters coming in, uh, then you don't necessarily incrementally increase the value of the the exports because, as I said earlier, such a huge proportion of Scottish exports come from from a very small number of um, of sectors, but it doesn't mean it's not important. And I, I mean, I just go, go if I go back to the Harris Tweet Everdays example. Um, we export about seventy percent of what what we produce. Um, it's probably a blip on the export statistics, but it creates there's over two hundred people uh, in a remote peripheral community who are in full, you know, in well waged employment who wouldn't be if it wasn't for exporting. Now, if you apply that to every one of your communities, you only need one company to get kind of good at exporting, and you, it's it's transformational in exactly the same uh, way. So it's, you know, I, I, I'm not into big uh, to big numbers, but I've absolutely no doubt about the importance of uh, of of this, and it's really worth taking taking. Just briefly, I know the conveners asked me to be brief. Yeah. Has any of your recommendations been implemented and do you have any frustrations in regards to your report not being implemented? Well, no, I'm, I'm, I'm actually delighted that, um, it's been, that the thing's been taken forward through a, a, a working group. I mean, that, I mean, I've been around this long enough not to have high expectations at, of the speed at which government, far less governments, move. Um, and it would not have surprised me if this had gone off a cliff and it would not have surprised me if, because it had come from a sort of Scotland office source, there had been a standoff, and we're not, we're not talking to you, or this is, you know, that's, we'll do this our own way. And not, the fact that that hasn't happened is, is good. And the fact that SDI is engaging with UKTI and so on, I mean, that will do me to, to, to go on with. And then maybe come back in a, a realistic way, I would say if you come back in a year and see how much of it has been implemented, then that would be the... Uh, that, that, that would be the, 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 the test. Uh, it hasn't been the right political period, really, for these, some of these things to go forward. I think that I mean, it can be. It can be now. I'm and sure that you're this committee is actually taking this forward at this time. I'm abs yes, I, I absolutely <laughs> am. And that the, okay. uh, but we, can all, we can all feed in towards a, a shared Good. objective. Mr Brody, do you have another brief? It's very brief. Um, but it's, it's refreshing to hear somebody say uh, that targets are a waste of time rather than continuous improvement outcomes. So thank you for that. Um, 
just just on, on on the business tourism and the attraction of inward investors, I wonder if you have any comment on <coughs> APD, which we know will change, but also on the visa arrangement system uh, that is kind of deployed by the Home Office. Uh, visas are a constant problem because there's a co there's a conflict of interest within government and uh, I, I don't it's, it's hard we're, usually when visa restrictions are imposed there's a good reason from one perspective which may not be a good reason or maybe a bad reason from another perspective and I don't think there's a I don't think you can adjudicate on that I think any any country would be faced with the same uh, issues that there are countries where we might want to um, you know, have uh, facilitate trade with uh, through a, a non-visa regime, but there might be good security reasons why you don't want to uh, to, to to lift a, a visa regime. So I don't think you can generalise, but all you can all I can say in this context is that the interests of trade should always be taken account of, um, but and that there should be no you know sort of one departmental veto um, from another another perspective. Uh, the first thing you said, a a APD. Um, well, APD. I, I was um, around when APD was in introduced in the 90s, 1990s, and it's always forgotten now. APD was introduced as an environmental measure, uh, not as a tax raising measure. Um, and the, um, I mean, it doesn't seem to work very well as an environmental measure. And there's always, I can't, there was probably. Once it's, it was it was predicted at the time that once it was there, it would just keep in, increasing. Um, I, I I live in a I, I think APD doesn't uh, apply if you start your journey in the Western Isles, um, but uh, it just means slightly cheaper flights, which is a good thing. But whether it's a is always a good thing from a social point of view, whether it's a good thing from an environmental point of view, uh, it might not be so obvious. And to be honest, I don't think it's a huge difference from a trade point point of view. Um, do you? Sorry, am I allowed to ask? Do you? Harvey, I do. do, you I do. To, Mr. Harvey, do you want to? Uh, very brief supplementary. Yeah. Um, on APD, um, a lot of the uh, rhetoric around the Scottish government's position till now has been for a halving and then a scrapping of APD if and when it gains the power and. Uh, the Smith proposals and the legislation that's, that flows from that seems to imply that that, that would happen. The new economic strategy uh, actually reframes it and says that they want to replace APD with uh, a different tax. Uh, do you think it's possible uh, to achieve a tax regime for aviation uh, which both uh, increases the connectivity, which is what the Scottish Government says it wants to do, and decreases the environmental impact of aviation and if so, how? It's not a question I pondered, but um, it's, it's a my my kind of in, instinct is that you know APD is not as big an issue as I, I don't think APD. I think APD has been a. It, it was introduced. It was introduced as an environmental measure under the guise of an environmental measure, anyway, and has as has essentially become a tax. Um, how much of a deterrent it is to flying doesn't seem to me to be very obvious because flying continues to increase and um, there's such variation in, in airfares that you know you, you can you, you can book across a huge range of prices which aren't affected but they're affected by factors other than than, than APD. Um, so I, I don't if, if I was in the, if I was inheriting the APD a responsibility, then I'm not sure I would want to transfer APD to some other tax tax because someone's going to be taxed to pay for getting rid of APD. So it would seem to me to be much more of a gesture than a substantial a benefit for anything. But I really do feel I'm getting outside the terms of my... <laughs> yeah. Um, no other member has indicated they wish to come in at this point. Um, so can I thank you, Mr. Wilson, for coming in? Um, and I think it's been very informative, and uh, I think you're yeah, absolutely the, the review in itself uh, made extremely interesting reading, and it's something that obviously this committee 
um, has welcomed in, in taking forward this uh, evidence session that we're doing. And just for the official report, um, can I extend the Murdo Fraser's uh, apologies uh, for not being at the meeting today. He's, enga he's uh, engaged in another meeting in Brussels, uh, and therefore that's why I'm convening today's meeting. And I now close this meeting and we go into private session. <laughs>